Hello AP Macro students, I'm Mr. Sanabria and today we're going to talk about something called the investment demand curve. And uh, as the name may indicate, this has a lot to do with investment. And by investment I am referring to uh, gross private investment that we may and should know from SIGX. So just to kind of uh, recap or put this into context, um, we learned the aggregate model recently and we've been using it uh, to describe the business cycle, right? And what I'm really setting us up for is to somehow be able to enact policies that might counter the business cycle itself. So we've identified that the business cycle um, is illustrated on the aggregate model by the, the aggregate demand curve shifting left and right. And because the things that would cause aggregate demand to shift left and right is SIGX, consumption spending, investment, government spending, and net exports, those four things become very important to us. And last time we talked about the spending multiplier, which really multiplies any change in um, expenditure for any of those components, right? Well, today we're going to talk specifically about why investment spending might change Okay, and the reason that this is important is because if investment spending changes, that changes the position of the uh, aggregate demand curve, and that's the business cycle. So that's why all of this is important. That's why we're talking about investment demand, um, and I think we should go ahead and get into it. So the place we need to start is by uh, making sure that we're clear on what exactly an investment is. Okay, so what is an investment? Well, it's money spent or expenditures, and I, I want to be able to use this term expenditures, right? And I want to be able to say total expenditure, and for you to understand that as sig x as well, right? Because the total spending is the total spending of, in the case of sig x, consumers, in, um, investment spending, the government, and the foreign sector net exports. So um, money spent or expenditures on new factories, um, machinery, capital equipment, technology. Um, remember we're lumping in new houses on this, right? We talked all about how new homes count as an investment um, and then inventories are also counted as part of investment. Okay, and I've got an extra little uh, animation on this PowerPoint, so you have to bear with me on that. Here's your key thing. Let's make sure that we understand that investment um, in economics is something that's going to lead to increased production. And if you can remember that, then you'll realize, oh, all of this is uh, increased production. Now, you do have the exception with the new homes. We, we're going to treat that a little differently. We, we classify those as investments, um, even though they don't lead to increased output or production. Um, but you do have uh, inventories, and that's also very uh, odd. But remember, we kind of had to figure out how we were going to count those things that don't get sold. Um, but normally, when we're talking about investment, we are actually talking about the first three here. Building or buying uh, factories. Um, machinery and technology. So that's what an investment is. Okay. So we have a thing called expected rate of return. Okay, and let's just follow through this slide here. How do how do businesses make investment decisions? Well, they do a cost benefit analysis. Okay. So if you're going to do a cost benefit analysis, well how do you determine the benefit of something? Well to determine the benefit, that's what's known as the expected rate of return. How much do you expect to make in uh, return for undertaking some investment. If I'm going to build a factory, well, how much product is that factory going to be able to make me? So I've determined the benefit. So I have to now determine the cost. And the cost is the interest rate. And that's kind of the key here, right? So how much am I going to um, make by doing this investment? And what is the interest rate? And why is the interest rate the cost? Well, because when businesses make an investment, they borrow money to make the investment. So, how does a business determine the amount of investment they undertake? You compare the expected rate of return to the interest, and if the expected rate of return is greater than the interest, then you invest, and if the expected rate of return is less than the interest, you don't invest. And there's my little animation. So it's a simple cost-benefit analysis, and I've really just introduced uh, the terminology of expected rate of return. Um, and link that to cost being interest rates. So, let's take a moment and understand the difference between real interest rates and nominal interest rates.
And before I even show what's on the slide, I'm going to give you kind of a framework to think about this. And I would like you to write this into your notes, and I want you to, um, to be able to think about this. Because when we're thinking about real versus nominal interest, um, it's also the same as real versus nominal wages. And moving in between real and nominal is actually pretty easy, but you got to keep a couple of things in mind. The whole idea of real anything is that it's adjusted for inflation. And nominal anything means uh, the effect of inflation is included. So it's, it's something that has some value in name. Um, and if you were to adjust the, the dollar amount for inflation, then it would be a real value. So inflation is a big part of this. So what you're really talking about is an expected rate of inflation. Um, so you have your expected inflation, or maybe you know the amount of inflation. And then you add that to the real whatever, in this case, interest rate. And that equals the nominal whatever it is, in this case, interest rate. So I wrote this in a mathematical equation. Okay, You have expected inflation plus real interest rate equals nominal interest rate. So now you've got these three variables, and so if you're given two out of three of them, then you know enough algebra that you can figure it out. So let's say that inflation is expected to be 5%. And let's say that the nominal interest rate is um, 7%. Let me make this bigger so that you can see perhaps a little better. So if the expected rate of inflation is 5% um, and nominal interest rate is 7%, then what is our real interest rate? And you would be able to probably pretty easily see that that must be 2%. And that's really what's going on. And when you think of or have to calculate real or nominal interest rates, I want you to write it out this way. I want you to write all of this and then plug in what you know over here, and I'm telling you it's going to make your life easier. You are always going to get the question right. Um, what if, if inflation is this and interest, nominal interest rate is that, what is the real interest rate? You'll always get it right if you draw that chart. So I'm going to show it to you one more time, okay? Write it out like that. Expected inflation, or if inflation is known, inflation plus real interest rate equals nominal interest rate. And this would all work if we were talking about nominal versus real wages as well. Um, same framework. So remember this. It does work. It's going to get you some points um, on your exams. So going back to the slide, let's, let's see what this says. Okay, Real interest rate equals nominal um, minus inflation. So you could write it out this way, but I prefer my method. Okay. Now notice um, just a note on graphing symbols. If you can follow my cursor, we've got real interest rate, which is a lower case italicized R. That's the convention I want you to use for real interest rates. It is a lower case R, that's real interest rate. For nominal interest rate, you've got a lowercase italicized i. That is for nominal interest. And a uppercase i is inflation, and you can use a pi symbol for inflation. That counts too. I want you to use these symbols. Now, in your reading and in some text, you will see a lowercase italicized r for rate of return. I don't want you to use that. That's not the convention the College Board uses. So, hey, let's just use that convention. And also, you will sometimes see a lowercase italicized i um, for just this blanket statement that sometimes includes real interest rates. I don't want you to do that. I want you to write them out um, just like you see them here. Okay? So, let me get myself out of the way and look at this last question. What determines the cost of an investment? The real interest rate. That is how much you really pay. Okay, we don't want to include inflation and what that does to our, our cost. We want to just talk about real interest rates. So that brings us to the investment demand curve itself. The investment demand curve is illustrated uh, by showing the relationship between um, real interest rates and gross private investment itself. Okay, real interest rates and gross private investment. And it's a negative relationship. 
Why is this a negative relationship? Well, there is your explanation. When interest rates are high, fewer investments are profitable. When interest rates are low, more investments are profitable. But why is that true? Most of the time, overwhelmingly, companies don't come right out of their uh, cash on hand to invest. They actually finance those investments. So if a company wants to buy a new factory, for instance, they're going to borrow money from a bank. They're going to finance that. They're going to pay back that loan over time, and they're going to pay interest on that money. Okay, so why would you borrow money to build a factory? Well, the reason you would borrow money to build a factory is because that factory is going to make you money, right? And this whole thing is as simple as understanding the following statement. If I'm going to make more money every year with that factory, then the amount of interest that I'm going to have to pay back on the loan that I had to, uh, to get to build that factory then I should build the factory. Okay, I just simple cost-benefit analysis. So conversely, um, you might think of this as there being very few investments that would yield a high rate of return and many investments that would yield a low rate of return. Okay, so how much am I going to get for building this factory? If I'm going to make 5% more per year for building this factory and a real interest rate on a loan is 4%, then I absolutely should build the factory because I can build the factory and have to pay 4% a year um, cost back, but I'm going to make 5% per year, so my profit margin is 1%. And that's as simple as this is. Okay, so now's a good time for me to draw for you the investment demand curve. Okay, so we are here and uh, we've got our investment demand curve, and all of this is doing is showing that negative or inverse relationship between real interest rates, which is a small r, and gross private investment. That just simply shows you the investment demand curve. So what you'll notice with a little bit of analysis is if real interest rates are right here, um, then there is this much investment. But if real interest rates were to increase, there would be fewer investment. Why? Well, loans are more expensive. It's more expensive to take out a loan, so I have to expect a higher rate of return on that investment if it's going to be possible for me to make that investment. But if real interest rates go down to right here, there would be a lot more investment because it's easy to find an investment that might get yield that low rate of return. And that's all there really is to this. We're going to talk today really about why this investment demand curve that we just looked at um, might actually shift and change and move around. Alright, so here's a slide with an investment demand curve on it and the statement is changes in real interest rates change, cause a change in um, the amount of gross private investment. Right, So factors other than real interest rate actually shift the whole curve. So what we're going to concern ourselves with today is shifting this entire curve. And real quick, just in case we're having a hard time visualizing that entire curve shifting, uh, let's go ahead and see what that would look like. So let me erase all of the red that I had on our um, investment demand curve. Here we are. What I'm saying is this. Okay, changes in real interest rates, they change the amount of investment. We already get that, but something other than a change in real interest rate would cause the whole curve to shift. And what's important about that is now at the same level of real interest rates, there's more investment, right? We move from this much investment, say real interest rate is 2%, we went from having this much investment, now we're all the way out here. That's a good thing if we're trying to grow the economy, right? If we're trying to increase GDP, more investment equals more um, aggregate expenditure, more SIG X, and, and aggregate demand would increase. So how do we make that happen? How do we increase investment demand? Conversely, things can change that would cause the investment demand curve to shift to the left. And in that case, at 2% real interest rates, we're getting less investment. So that's why this is important. 
Let's go ahead now then and talk about what those determinants might be, those determinants of investment demand. And we've got a little couple of examples there. So the determinant of investment demand is cost of production, right? Lower costs shift the investment demand curve out. Why? Because it's easier to find those investments that would yield more of a return. Higher costs shift investment demand to the left. Another thing is business taxes. Lower business taxes shift investment demand to the right. Higher business taxes shift investment demand to the left. Expectations, they're going to work similarly. Positive expectations shift investment demand to the right. Negative expectations shift investment demand to the left. Um, and what we're looking at here is a list of determinants that you might begin to recognize. Don't these remind you of those same things that would uh, shift the aggregate supply curve. They're very much similar. So what we're seeing here is that we've got the cost of doing business. We're thinking about the cost of doing business, but specifically in the way that it affects how much you're going to invest in growing your business. Okay, So that is why these things are going to affect investment demand and investment demand will affect ultimately the aggregate demand curve. So there's a couple of more. How much capital do you actually have? Okay. And a technological change. And so you can see that how these relationships work. I'm not going to hang out too much on these because uh, they're not really the most important part of this. So when investment demand shifts, different levels of gross private investment occur even while real interest rates remain constant. And that's what I illustrated on the whiteboard a couple of minutes ago. But let's go ahead and see um, how it looks illustrated. All right. So there's this idea called instability of investment. What instability of investment is describing is this. It's basically just describing the fact that the investment demand curve doesn't stay in one spot. So we were just looking at the things that move investment demand back and forth. And what I'm telling you now is the fact that investment demand curve shifts back and forth all the time, that's known as instability of investment. And what's important for you to understand, and I need you to write this into your notes, is that uh, gross private investment is the most volatile, meaning it changes the most. It has the most wild swings of any other of the components of aggregate expenditure. So of all of SIGX, it's gross private investment that moves around the most, that changes the most. The level of inv investment changes the most. And that phenomenon is called instability of investment. So why? Why does uh, the investment demand curve shift so much? Well, there's this idea of durability. Because capital has such a long lifespan, um, you, buy, you build up the, the amount of capital, and then you just use it and use it and use it and use it, and there ends up being this long dry period, um, perhaps, where businesses don't need to invest anymore. So capital goods being much more durable, typically, than consumer goods, they end up being more cyclical like this. Uh, there's this irregularity of innovation because innovation isn't this smooth fashion. There's these bursts of innovation, right? You had the Industrial Revolution and everybody outfitted their, um, their machinery uh, initially, really, to operate off of steam. And then again with coal and electricity. And then uh, you had all these, these booms. Now we're currently in the information technology and telecommunications boom. Um, and so you know, this doesn't happen all smoothly. It kind of, it's kind of like a punctuated equilibrium if you want to think about uh, more of a uh, biology metaphor. Let's continue with this. There's this idea of variability of profits. Sometimes businesses are more profitable than other times, right? Um, cyclical changes in the economy, like the business cycle, or uh, just the, the actual management of a business. If a business is less profitable, it's going to be, uh, they're going to demand fewer investments. And then there's this idea of expectations, okay? Because it's as much psychology as anything else. Businesses that think and expect 
big returns in the future are going to invest heavily in um, more capital now. And so all of this, this whole lesson has really been about this statement. Many economists believe that investment instability is the chief cause of the business cycle. And that's why this is important to us. Okay, so I've just got a picture of the business cycle under here. But understand that investment demand is the most volatile component of SIGX. And so the things that shift around investment are very important. But what we really want to understand is that relationship between real interest rates and the amount of investment. So if real interest rates go up, then the amount of investment goes down. And if real interest rates go down, the amount of investment goes up. And that's our key relationship. Okay, Our key relationship is that. And in this uh, last part of the video, I'm going to tell us why that's so important. Hey there, so in this last part of the video, what I want to do is I want to answer the question that's probably on everybody's mind. What makes gross private investment a big deal? Uh, well, maybe you didn't even know it was a big deal, but I'm going to tell you right now, gross private investment is a big deal. And I'm just going to say investment for the rest of the video. Investment is a big deal. So what makes it a big deal? Well, the first thing that makes investment a big deal is that it's part of SIGX, right? So we know that SIGX is important. Why is SIGX so important? Well, because SIGX equals GDP, right? SIGX equals GDP. So the fact that investment is a component of GDP makes it a big deal. But you're thinking, well, that's not a super big deal because so is consumption spending, so is gro uh, government spending, and so is net exports. So is, is gross private investment a big deal just because it's part of SIGX? No. It's a big deal also because we know that a change in SIGX equals a change in aggregate demand. So this statement is also true. Changes in SIGX equal a change in aggregate demand. And investment is part of SIGX. And I haven't really <clears throat> told you yet anything about why SIGX is any more um, important or more of a big deal than any of the other components. But we're going to get there. So a change in aggregate demand is the business cycle. And that's a big deal because this course exists because the business cycle exists and we're trying to figure out how to stop it. We're trying to counter the business cycle. So a change in aggregate demand equals the business cycle. So why is investment any more of a big deal than any other component of SIGX? I guess that's where, where we're to now. That's the question at this point. Because consumption spending is a big deal, right? It's 70% of GDP, so that makes it a pretty big deal. Um, government spending, um, well, we're going to talk about that, but obviously it's important too. And net exports are very important. But I'm telling you right now all about how investment is a big deal. And I'm going to tell you that that's because investment leads to more capital. So this statement makes investment a big deal. Investment leads to more capital, or capital formation, right? We form more capital. So investment leads to more capital. Well, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because more capital leads to economic growth. That's why investment's a big deal. More capital leads to economic growth. Let's think about for a moment what economic growth is again. Economic growth is a shifting outward of your production possibilities, right? Economic growth is taking long-run aggregate supply and moving it out and bringing the rest of aggregate supply and demand, uh, the equilibrium, out there with it, right? Economic growth is only possible if you increase your resources. And what are your resources? They're the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So the only one of those that we can really address is capital. We can make a conscious decision to invest in capital.
That's what the power of investment is. Because when you increase investment, you are increasing your amount of capital. It's the one way that we can just say we want more resources. And the resources we want is capital. Okay? So capital is a huge deal. Consumption spending is a huge deal because it's 70% of GDP. But when consumers spend more money, all you can really do is recover an economy. The economy will recover if consumers spend more money. But it can't grow because consumers are spending money. In fact, it, the only thing that can happen is if consumers spend too much money, then there might be inflation. But investment spending, if that increases, yes, you push aggregate demand out, but you also create capital. And the longer term effect is that short run aggregate supply itself will shift outward because you have more resources now. You have now built more factories, more roads, more uh, telecommunications infrastructure, more machinery. So investment spending is a big deal because it leads to capital formation. Now, what this lesson is mostly about is how interest rates affect investment. So let's go ahead and reiterate that relationship and then I'm going to let you go. Real interest rates, an increase in real interest rates equal a decrease in investment. It's a negative relationship. That's what the investment demand curve is. It shows this negative relationship. An increase in real interest rates leads to a decrease in investment. A decrease in real interest rates equals a increase in gross private investment. Okay, that relationship's true. That's your investment demand curve. That is that is this. That's your investment demand curve. So we're going to actually learn a lot about interest rates and how they change when we talk about the Federal Reserve Bank. What the Fed can ultimately do is control interest rates. And the reason that that's important is because it affects directly, or really there's an indirect relationship here, right? There's an inverse relationship between interest rates and investment. Does that make sense? So we know investment's a big deal. We know that they're negatively related to real interest rates. And I just told you that the Federal Reserve Bank can control interest rates. That's the big picture. So when the Federal Reserve Bank tries to counter the business cycle by manipulating interest rates, what they're really doing is they're manipulating investment and they're affecting the demand curve, the aggregate demand curve. So I hope that puts all of this into perspective. I hope now you realize um, and understand, A, that there is a, an inverse relationship between real interest rates and gross private investment, because that's the main point here. And B, that gross private investment is a big deal, and it's because investment leads to capital, and capital leads to growth in the economy. So that's enough for today. You do have a test to study for. Happy studying, and I will see you next time.